my name is Phil Officer. I'm a National Park Ranger at Fort Frederica National Monument, uh, which means I have the odd distinction of being Ranger Officer. So if everyone just calls me Phil, we'll get along great. <laughs> Just got one of those last names that, uh, that rings along with it. Um, I like to kind of start things off when I do presentations about Fort Frederica in general by just asking a very kind of basic question of the group that I'm talking to, uh, which is, if we're all being honest, how many people here have never been to Fort Frederica in their lives? <laughs> how many people don't really know much about it whatsoever? You have just joined the ranks of 95% of our visitors to Fort Frederica, uh, which, and, and a lot of my peers at work, sometimes they frankly get a little upset about that. Like, how come no one knows our story? I see that as much more of a re uh, way to engage people because it is a story that we are legitimately uncovering and we are legitimately rediscovering. And that's an exciting thing. Case in point, Fort Frederica, of course, is a colonial site, much like Ebenezer and Savannah. And when I am in front of groups talking to them about Fort Frederica, uh, I often start with a question of just like, if we all thought back to our high school history tests, all right, everyone get in that place for a second, that mental space. If you're not in high school yet, think ahead. <laughs> and try to recall, if you can, what the first permanent long-term settlement in what we now know as the United States and what immediately comes to mind. And more often than not, people pick a small little location up in an area known as Virginia called Jamestown. 1607, right? Jamestown, first successful British colony, the first of the 13 colonies, right? Not quite. Because, first off, Jamestown was not the first British settlement. There was one in Roanoke in 1585 that was unsuccessful. But in order for something to be successful, you've got to try first, right? So, I mean, you'd think that they would you know, put that together. But nonetheless, uh, we often are taught the 13 colonies. And so we think of you know, it life in that kind of window, that box, where we're thinking, okay, the 13 colonies, Jamestown, I mean, you rattle off the states that you come, immediately come to mind. But of course, St. Augustine, 1565, St. Augustine settled by the Spanish in what we now know as Florida. But what we know as Florida today, that's not Florida. That's what Florida became. Florida was the entire southeast of the United States, ranging all the way up into Kentucky, down through Texas. A massive swath of land that slowly over time, from the Spanish perspective, was chipped away at by those pesky British and those pesky French. And that's kind of where I want to kind of start our conversation here today. Because when you think about colonial America, we often look in those small kind of windows. If we're really being honest, we like the Spark Notes version. You know, we kind of like, okay, Jamestown, then we had Plymouth Rock in Massachusetts, and then the 1776, the American Revolution. <laughs> Well, we're also forgetting 1775, which is a whole year of the war. But nonetheless, <laughs> let's take a second and put our hats on to look back at a point that many of us may have forgotten about, that many of us maybe never knew about, never learned about, and kind of rediscover that. Now, before I go further, I probably should say that if you haven't guessed it yet, I'm a little bit of a storyteller. <laughs> But that doesn't mean that I like everyone to remain utterly silent while I just talk at you guys for about 30 or 40 minutes. Uh, if you have questions, of course, feel free to ask. However, because I tend to be a bit of a storyteller, I'm like, great point. I'm going to mention that in about five minutes. Uh, if I say that I'll do that, and I never actually get to what your question was, remind me. Uh, so let's take our step back in time. And if we can, put ourselves in the actual, put the actual shoes as best we can, knowing it is, in fact, March 11th, 2023. Let's imagine for a second it's not. Let's say for a second that it's the 1730s, early 1730s. 
And I'm not looking at a group of people, looking at a guy dressed very funny up at the pulpit here giving a presentation. No, I'm looking at a group of people who are looking for a second opportunity. I'm looking at a group of people who have very different backgrounds and very different professions. Now, everybody here is all highly skilled at what you do. Just perhaps you're not the most financially successful at doing it. Some of you might be in danger, in fact, of going into what's called debtor's prison, a reality. A reality in the 1700s where people die. And it's because of that that the man that you see on the left in this image starts getting these grand ideas. His, one of his best friends, in fact, goes through financial hardship, ends up in debtor's prison, and dies of disease. And so this idea pops into his head. He's not alone in this thinking. He assembles a group of like-minded individuals, a group of board of trustees, to come up with this noble vision of a land of opportunity. And I'm looking at people who want that opportunity, but you've got to pass an interview. So what do you get for your time? What do you get for this chance? If you pass this interview, I am willing to grant to you, as a representative of the Board of Trustees, I like to give myself a little bit of authority, I'll give you passage across the Atlantic Ocean. Seven years of indentured servitude that you don't have to worry about, I'm going to ask that you give me one. I will give you provisions so that you don't have to worry about food or supplies for a full year. I will give you land in a brand new world. Now, if this seems a little too good to be true, here's the catch. Georgia, namesake of King George II, is not the Georgia we know today in 2023 in this time. No, 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 no. Georgia extends from the Savannah River to the Altamaha River. Now, at this point, we've already started setting up Savannah, for it is not 17. 32 in our little story here today. We are talking about 1735. Ebenezer has already been settled as well. The first Germans have made their way over across and have settled here on the site that we are sitting in right now. But I'm talking about putting you at a different location. I'm not putting you in Georgia. I need you to build for me from the ground up a new town, a new settlement, a military fortification four miles below what Georgia is. And I'm not putting you necessarily in a safe space because 85 miles from where I'm going to put you is going to be St. Augustine, Florida. The base of operations for the Spanish in what we know is Florida and we are going to put you in what we're calling affectionately the debatable land between Britain and Spain. However, Spain, <laughs> they don't see it that way. But we need you to help us set up this fortification. I'm looking at a mixture of a group of Scots, English, and Salzburgers. But we'll touch on that here in a second. Now, it's going to be hard, it's going to be difficult, but that's what I need you to do. And we are going to call this brand new community Fort Frederica. So where do we get the name? Well, King George II has a son, Crown Prince Frederick. And there already is a Fort Frederick. Uh, there's a Frederick up in what we now know as Maryland. Uh, there's a Fredericksburg in Virginia. There's already a Frederick, Virginia. That becomes Winchester later on. Uh, so we got to change the name, so we're going to call it Frederica. Now, putting our 2023 hats back on, we're commonly asked about 
the name, like why people would call it Frederica instead of Frederick. Uh, I always like to comment that no one ever asks us why is it called Georgia and not George. <laughs> <laughs> So the fun fact is, this is the opportunity I'm going to put you in for. Anyone, uh, anyone not want to take this chance in this new world? Just putting it out there. No? So people start making their way over to what we know as Fort, uh, Frederica. And that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone wants to go to Frederica. In fact, the uh, Salzburgers were expecting that they were going to be put into Ebenezer. They're not very happy when supplies start getting diverted to this new fortification that they're going to start building here in 1736, when they land in 1736. Now, when you drive to St. Simon's Island today, in 2023, it's a very beautiful location. I'm fond of it. I think it's very pretty. Uh, this is the fourth national park that I've worked at. I've actually worked in Yellowstone and Death Valley. I've worked at Harpers Ferry National Historical Park. And St. Simon's is a very pretty location with the lovely oak trees and the Spanish moss that just kind of dangles and creates this very kind of romantic atmosphere. You need to erase all that with your heads because we're dropping you in the Georgia frontier which means that you are going to be felling all of these trees. Not like in 2023, if you want to put a nice shed in your backyard, you know, you house your lawn equipment. Today, if I wanted to build something, all I have to do is simply go to a home improvement store, go through the aisles, I find the, the timber, the materials I need to actually build something. And then my eye glances over towards the power tools and I start talking to myself into how I need a new impact driver. It's even got the flashlight on it this time. That's pretty cool. And then I take that home and my wife gets mad at me because I did not need a new impact driver. <laughs> but that's not the case in 1736. You gotta cut down a tree, you're gonna cut it down with an ax. You're gonna take it to someone who's trained to use that tree. They are a carpenter and with hand tools, hand shape that tree into timbers, but not just timbers. What's the likelihood here that anyone in our party of the first settlers here of Fort Frederica would be utilizing I don't know, a large ship to transport your household goods? Not likely. So we're going to have to hand build everything in the community, right? Okay, so that means tables, chairs, wardrobes shipped in from Savannah, which is three years old at this point in time, and from Ebenezer here as well. And when you start actually building up this fortification, well, the carpenter is going to be very busy. So you get your frame, your timbers, you go find someone sitting next to a large set of oyster beds who's shoveling oysters into a large bonfire, burning them at very high heat until they reduce down to raw lime. Mix that with water and sand, you got a basic concrete, then you got to add more oyster shells on top of that to make your tabby. And you're slowly laying your tabby walls, which takes you on average about one week to harden for your first foundation. Then you do that again and again and again, slowly layering up until finally you have four tabby walls. Oh, but now you need all your metal components. So you find someone sitting next to a large set of bellows and they're hand cranking these bellows all day long, eight to 12 hours a day, burning that, uh, the coal forge at over 1700 degrees Fahrenheit until iron becomes malleable, and then hand making things like your hinges, your doorknobs, and your nails. How many nails go in a house? Lots. How hot does it get here in the summertime? What's the humidity level in the summertime? Who wants to be cranking in eight hours to 12 hours a day to bellows to produce nails? The amount of physical effort that goes into constructing something is immense. And when you actually think of what they're building, designed actually by a German, Samuel Osberger, in fact, a Swiss, I should say, yeah. you end up with an area that has a nine foot tall earthwork wall that runs one mile in circumference around the entire community, a star fortification of four points, nine feet tall earthwork wall reinforced with logs, six foot deep moat around both, hand dug. Then you factor in you're building all of your individual houses and lots. You're given a lot 60 by 90 feet. And slowly over time, you start building up this fortification. Think of the physical effort that goes into building something like that. Where do you get that physical effort from? Well, you need people who have that skill set. Enter not only the British and the Scots, who are already a little bit at loggerheads, you can imagine, but you get Germans. Now, we like labels 
and terminology that just kind of just lumps people together in a grand sense. You use things like Salzburgers, for instance. But at Frederico, what we know is that not everyone actually came from Salzburg. In fact, they came from all over. They came from Swabia, the Rhenish Palatinate, hence the name Palatines, which is another overall youth, uh, term that they use for these people. They came from Alsace, which was contested between France and, and what would become Germany for quite some time into the 20th century. They came from places like Saxony, Brandenburg, Switzerland, and yes, of course, Salzburg. And yet, all told, we tend to lump them into two general groups of Palatinates and Salzburgers, uh, even though across the board they come from a wide section of what would become modern-day Germany. And they're all there for a basic reason that they are there to help build this particular town, build this particular community. One of our famous citizens, Samuel Davison, who's famous for owning and operating a tavern in Frederica, coincidentally he was also our town constable, which I think is an interesting collection of jobs. Uh, Davison at one point comments that essentially there is no work for the English to do because the Germans are doing all of it. So presents this kind of interesting standpoint. And so over time, Frederica really starts to take shape. But what becomes you know, interesting is that although we are all working together does not mean we all, in fact, lived together. On St. Simon's Island, Fort Frederica is placed right here. But that does not mean that most of our German people here were actually in Fort Frederica proper. In fact, most of them ended up in a small community that we became known as, oh, Germantown. <laughs> About a mile and a half wet, due east of where the town was. And this is in this point where a lot of these people start really turning St. Simon's Island into large farms to help feed the operation on St. Simon's Island at Fort Frederica particularly. Oglethorpe himself could not have done what he did at Fort Frederica without the Salzburger, without the Germanic peoples farming these lands and providing crops to feed the people of Fort Frederica. It would have been nearly impossible for him to do that. And so with their assistance, St. Simon's Island started to thrive as Fort Frederica. And I do mean thrive. By the 1740s, this was a town of about a thousand people all told, living and working within this community. And it was a military fortification at that. And that's where our story has to kind of transition for a second. Because remember how I started off saying where we are and where I'm going to put you and the kind of risk you're inherently taking here? Time to bring that back into focus a little bit. Because we keep thinking that the risk comes from the Spanish. Well, what if we put ourselves for a moment in the Spanish perspective? Let's say for a second that I'm representing Britain in this particular tale. Uh, and I'm looking out here at a group of Spanish settlers down, of course, in the blue star, which is St. Augustine, Florida. Now, 1665, we come to an agreement. Much of treaties tend to happen here. You guys let me take South Carolina. I'm able to keep South Carolina, and we come to an arrangement, okay? This is now the border. Does that mean that everything kind of in between is up for grabs, or in your mind, is it yours? Hands uh, if you think it's yours. It's yours. Because <laughs> where did Florida stop? Kentucky, right? So are you likely just to kind of give that up? Not really. But 1665, we come to this arrangement. OK, great. Then 1732, Oglethorpe, the British, and of course, the Germans here at Ebenezer, we settle what we now know as Savannah and Georgia. And we want to protect our interests, right? Because, well, you know, you folks are making me nervous. So you start putting up fortifications. 1736, you put up Fort Frederica. Okay, now you've taken a big swath because you've jumped all the way down here to the Altamaha River, four miles below that. We're now claiming down there. Okay, slowly, we're slowly making efforts. We're not doing anything too overly aggressive because we don't want to really kind of tread the waters here. <laughs> what are we doing? Forts are supposed to be defensive. 
Are we acting defensively? Or are we acting aggressively? We're moving south. Now, if you're the Spanish, how are you, how are you feeling right about now? Nervous. We're poking the bear. Tensions have been boiling for a little while now. Uh, there's an event that happens in 1731 that kind of colors this age, so to speak, with a funny kind of name. Uh, 1731, there's a British sailor named Robert Jenkins. He finds himself off the coast of Cuba. He's the captain of a British sailing vessel, the Rebecca, and in that avenue, he gets boarded by the Spanish Coast Guard. The Spanish Coast Guard thinks he's a privateer, a pirate with a purpose. He says he's not. Scuffle, his right ear's cut off. Now, he says he was told by the Spanish captain to take your ear to your British king. So he does the responsible thing in his mind. He pops it into a bottle of rum and he takes it to King George II. <laughs> and King George, this becomes a rallying cry. Jenkins' ear becomes a rallying cry in British Parliament. How dare they? Never mind if they were in British territory, we probably would do the same thing. But how dare they do it? <laughs> By 1739, tensions have boiled over, and as you can see, Oglethorpe hasn't really helped himself here. <laughs> um, tensions boil over, and the war becomes known as the War of Jenkins' Ear. Though, looking at this map, show of hands if you think it's really about an ear. <laughs> about something a little bit different than that. Oglethorpe is a little on the nervous side. Sir, right here in the front, I'm going to use you if you don't mind. I'm going to suggest for a moment you are James Oglethorpe himself, okay? Now, that blue star, that's St. Augustine. Now, in 2023, I have this wonderful little thing in my pocket uh, that tells me practically anything that I want to know, right? I can find out what the temperature is in Berlin, Germany right now. Uh, do I have this in my pocket in 1740? No. I have the written word, and I have what's right in front of my eyes. But more than that, I have what's not right in front of my eyes. And what's not in front of your eyes can sometimes drive you crazy. So Mr. Oglethorpe, what do you do? I want to get what are they doing down there? What are they doing down there? Understandable. We're going to attack first. Uh, we are going to take with us 900 men stemming from Scots, Highlanders, Creek natives, British regular troops, Georgia Rangers and South Carolina Rangers, and it's the South Carolina Rangers that are significant to our story here at Ebenezer here today, because the South Carolina Rangers have detachments of German settlers from Perrysburg, Swiss Germans at that who sail down with Oglethorpe as those 900 men, and they sail down to St. Augustine, Florida, and they will lay siege to the Castillo de San Marcos for six weeks. And Mr. Oglethorpe, you're gonna fire cannon shell after cannon shell directly into those uh, fortifications. Now, Mr. Montiano right over here, Spanish commander of all of Florida. This is annoying. But we'll come back to your side here in a second. Six weeks, Mr. Oglethorpe, you lay siege. Eventually, you run out of supplies. How important is supply? Everything. Yeah, OK. Um, can you maintain this uh, particular siege without supply? No. Uh, how about the rest of our 900 here? All in favor of kind of abandoning it and just going home? Yeah, OK. So we're going to fall back. Now, this is, this is embarrassing for you because you initiated this attack, and you're falling back, and one could say because of poor planning? You can find people to blame, I'm sure. Oh, they didn't support me, they didn't do this and that, but you are the commander in charge of this regiment. You've been given a regiment of troops at this point called the 42nd Regiment of Foot, stationed at Fort Frederica, 600 men. Now, you head back to Frederica and you start preparing your defenses which include all of those fortifications heading south that we just looked at. You start ramping up productions and you begin the waiting game. And you wait a month, two months, three, 
Six. A year. A year and a half. He's got to be coming, right? He's, he, he, he's, he's going to have to do something. A year and a half later, July 1742. Your men in your lower fortifications here, they see something that wasn't there before. They see a lot of it. 36 sailing vessels heading out of St. Augustine. Uh, Mr. Montiano, he really, he made you mad, didn't he? <laughs> Montiano has been given orders by the Spanish government to burn and destroy British settlements along the way, all that he comes across. Now, Oglethorpe's men open fire, but is that going to do a whole lot of good against 36 ships? No. Fall back, fall back, fall back, fall back, fall back. Rallying on St. Simon's Island, where Oglethorpe has put two fortifications at this point in time, Fort St. Simon's at the southern tip and Fort Frederica. Now, you can imagine that tensions are probably pretty high in the community. Where would your mind space be as one of these settlers in, say, Germantown, outside of Frederica's walls. And something doesn't feel right. Now, Mr. Montiano, your ships come inside of Fort St. Simons. They open fire, but, I mean, you have 36 ships. You just sail right past it. And you sail around the island to a spot where, if you've ever been to St. Simons, the actual bridge of the island lands at a spot called Gascoigne Bluff. That's where Mr. Montiano offloads nearly 3,000 Spanish troops. He, he really made you mad. <laughs> His men march overland to Fort St. Simons. They walk in without firing a shot because Mr. Oglethorpe here has pulled his men back to Fort Frederica. Now, we don't have all the information, but I would imagine that would involve also the settlers being pulled back into Fort Frederica's walls as well. Can you imagine how tense that environment would be inside that fortification while well, you know that close to 3,000 troops on the southern tip of your island, a mere four miles away, are encamped, and they're coming for you. Now, the next day, Mr. Montiano, you're going to send about 75 men out in a reconnaissance force. You will need to figure out some basic information. Where is he at? What's he doing? Uh, cannons. How many cannons does he have? How many men does he have? The basic stuff you need to mount a siege. Uh, they get about a half mile away when they're spotted by forces loyal to Oglethorpe. These Georgia Rangers, as well as Creek natives. Word gets to Mr. Oglethorpe, you're many things, Mr. Oglethorpe, but a man of even temper, not one of them. Um, Oglethorpe goes racing out of Frederica with a contingent of Scottish Highlanders, Creek natives, and Georgia Rangers. He leaves behind the 42nd Regiment, the highly skilled infantry unit that he's been put in charge of. They smash into the Spanish force, becomes a hand-to-hand -hand fight, and the Spanish force is pushed back. Oglethorpe stays on them, gathers up men from the 42nd, races down the island, finds a spot where he's going to mount an ambush. He thinks what's going to happen is that the men are going to run into Fort St. Simons. Montiano, this is what happened, and you're going to have to cover your retreat. So you're going to send men out to recover your men coming back in. That's when you're going to hit them. It's going to be a brilliant military move on your part. Glory to Mr. Oglethorpe. You're going to do a wonderful job. You just need more men. So you have two options, sir. Race back to Frederica yourself on horseback in glorious fashion, or send a lieutenant to do that for you. What should you do? What do you think he did? He went back himself. He went back himself. <laughs> Leaves his men in the field. Arguably, you should never do that. <laughs> Spanish force comes up, the Battle of Bloody Marsh erupts in St. Simon's Island. But the fun fact about Bloody Marsh is that Bloody Marsh gets all the luster, not as significant as the first battle of the day, Battle of Gully Hole Creek. And here's what I mean. Uh, let's see. I see the gentleman right there, uh, right behind the lady in purple, sir. I'm going to use you in this instant. Now, we're a little separated from each other, right? But I can see you plainly, and you can see me plainly. I'm wearing a very funny outfit with a badge on it. I mean, how could you miss me? Let's put about 50 yards between us in our minds. Throw some large grasses here. Okay, that's going to obscure things. Our weapons create a great deal of smoke and noise. And then it starts to rain. I can't quite see you, so I'm going to fire that way. You fire that way. I hear you, and I turn and I fire this way, and you fire that way. Now, I'm representing the British in our story here today, and you'll see why I chose to take that side here in a second. Because 
something starts to happen. There's a term called the fog of war. People think it's a literal fog bank. Well, our muskets do create a great deal of smoke. So there's a great deal of fog, that's sure, but it's also a state of mind. I can't see you. I can hear you. I know you're there. How many of you are there? I mean, it seems like hundreds, maybe. I don't know. All these gunshots, things are getting confused. I start to panic, and I break and I run away. Half of the British troops break and run. They're rallied by a, Brit a, British, a British lieutenant, keeps the gunfight going for half an hour, more. And the Spanish, sir, you're never aware of it, so you just kind of keep firing into the cloud. Spanish reach back into their cartridge boxes that hold their ammunition, and they find them empty. Battle breaks off naturally. Montiano, you're going to report casualties exceptionally light. Oglethorpe's men will one day say the marsh ran red with the blood of Spanish soldiers, but they leave out the bit we turned and ran away. <laughs> Seven days later, Montiano, you're going to leave St. Simon's Island because you get some bad information. You get some information that says that Oglethorpe is bringing up reinforcements. Now, this starts playing in your mind about what you can do. Where's your safest bet? Is it digging in at St. Simon's or heading back to the Castillo? Heading back to the Castillo? Safe bet for you? Okay. Um, we should probably tell him what's happening, right? Yeah, probably a good idea. Um, here's the thing, Mr. Oglethorpe. Before he landed a single soldier, you had requested assistance from South Carolina. They told him no. And you know that. So you actually told a captive from the first part of the day that South Carolina is landing you massive amounts of reinforcements, and they're landing right about here, and I need you to go tell my ship's captains that. It's a lie. But it's a lie that when this captive runs back to you, which of course is what he's going to do, what's the likelihood that a captive is going to actually do what he's told to do and race off to an enemy general? He comes back in, he tells you this message, you don't have anything to suggest otherwise. So you back off. You outnumbered him nearly two to one. <laughs> now, Mr. Oglethorpe, your dander's up. Why not attack again, right? <laughs> Did it go any better the second time? No. <laughs> No. So the battle breaks off, and that ends our battle part of the story, but that doesn't mean that our story ends. Because that's where things kind of get interesting. You know, Fort Frederica is a, is a park where we usually just get to that point in the story and kind of say, let's just get to modern day with it. And it's because there tends to be gaps in what we know beyond that. But what we do know in 1741, one year prior to Bloody Marsh and Gully Hole Creek and the invasion of the Spanish, Oglethorpe starts petitioning Boltzius here at Ebenezer for a Lutheran minister for his Germanic workers. Uh, he's accrued a decent amount of Germanic workers at this point in time, and there's no one to actually minister to them, which you can imagine is causing some tension because, you know, the Lutherans are not Anglicans, and the likelihood that they would actually just kind of get along with an Anglican minister is challenging. You have the Wesleys there, the founders of Methodism. They're also there in, in, in this time period. But there's also, that creates some tensions there as well. So you want to try and mitigate these purposes. We want everybody to get along. So how do you do that? Well, Let's try to appease everybody. We need a Lutheran minister here at Fort Frederica. 1743, 1741 actually, there is a volunteer. His name is Johann Dreisler. He is in Germany, or what we at that point become Germany, and he volunteers for the assignment. Uh, in fact, uh, he had, had been uh, Boltius' actual teacher at one point in time, if I'm mistaken. He was someone else's teacher, in fact. Franke's teacher. So, Dreisler volunteers the assignment. You'd think that'd be pretty easy for him to get over here then. They find their candidate. No, it takes two years for Dreisler to show up. When Dreisler shows up, Oglethorpe, fun fact, is already gone. 
Oglethorpe leaves Georgia entirely in 1743. Uh, he actually heads back to the United Kingdom for a couple different reasons. One of them was the fact that along with the rest of the Board of Trustees, he's been paying out of pocket to keep Georgia going. And you can imagine with costs going up, he's looking to be repaid. Eventually, he will be repaid to the tune of around $10 million current U.S. money, which you think if you're actually Oglethorpe himself, that's a lot of money to put up for a colony that could work. But it does. And so he's back in 1743, so Oglethorpe and Dreisler actually have no interaction whatsoever. Dreisler reports down to Fort Frederica and kind of quickly wins over a lot of the people in that community. And in fact, he, in 1745, becomes the appointed, the actual schoolmaster of the school in Frederica for the uh, people who live there. We get a lot of people that will come to Fort Frederica, they read fortification or fort, and they think that, oh, it must have been a lot of men. In reality, it was a lot of families that were there in Fort Frederica. And families, of course, have children. And if you don't have anyone to instruct the children, that also kind of creates tension and problems. So Dreisler becomes the schoolmaster in 1745. Now, Dreisler, if you're not aware of him, was a bit of a letter writer. <laughs> he wrote copious amounts of letters. We're talking 10, 15-page letters about his experiences living and working inside of Fort Frederica and in the community here in Georgia. And through this kind of treasure trove of information, we're able to kind of glean bits and pieces of how what life was like for the average people living and working here in Fort Frederica during that time. Uh, Dreisler was the kind of person who got along fairly well. I mean, he got a, a Captain Horton, who had been left in charge of Fort Frederica in absence of, becomes Major Horton at one point, uh, in absence of Oglethorpe, speaks highly of Dreisler. Uh, and Dreisler has some kind of interesting stories that kind of go along with his life there. Uh, you know, he works in this kind of community made up of British soldiers, as well as Scottish Highlanders and Creek natives, and of course people from a wide variety of different places all over modern day Germany, including Switzerland and Salzburg, Austria. And he pieces together kind of an interesting life. Uh, he had a very interesting Holy Week um, one year which I think is kind of fitting as we are now, of course, in, in the time of Lent, to kind of tell you that story. Uh, Dreisler tells that on Good Friday, the arsenal went up in flames. He was sitting inside of the schoolhouse, praying feverishly, he said, as this powder magazine burned. And as it hit the ammunition, Gunshots and booms and bangs go out and rain shot and shell onto the community. And yet the schoolhouse remained unscathed, the sign of the good Lord's faith in him and faith in his mission there. Uh, you would think that would be tense enough. Well, he reports in one of his long letters not only that particular story, but the story that on Easter Sunday, as he's preparing his sermon, a gunshot rang out and a bullet flew right over his head and lodged into the wall and created a hole the size of an egg. Of course, a little on the you know, worked up side, he races out and he finds a poor militiaman who had been trying to do some target practice and had missed his target by shooting high about a foot <laughs> and sailed the bullet straight into his house, narrowly missing Dreisler himself. Dreisler also speaks of a man named Christian Preber, uh, who was an interesting character of his own sort. Uh, Christian Preber uh, was a Germanic man who uh, tried to lead an uprising of the Cherokee peoples against the British. He was ended up being captured, and he was brought to Fort Frederica and put in jail, and he said he was very stoic and kind of very highly intelligent, regarded as very highly intelligent, very personable, but very stoic figure. In fact, when the arsenal exploded, he was said to be sitting upright in his cell and he remained motionless as if nothing had ever happened, even though the arsenal was adjacent to his cell by about 50 yards. <laughs> now, why this timeline is particularly interesting to Frederica's story is the fact that Frederica's history is very brief, as is the German people's time at Frederica. You know, 1746, Captain uh, Davis brings 64 German servants, as they were listed here to Ebenezer. In 1747, you know, Boltzus receives a letter from Mrs. Dreisler, Dreisler's wife. At this point, his, her husband is deceased. 
and recites that there's very few of our Germans left here. By December 20th, 1747, all Germans are gone from Fort Frederica entirely, except two families. There had been 65 when Dreisler showed up in 1743, a mere four years later, but two families remain. This kind of attrition was common in Frederica's time frame. People didn't tend to stay very long. Once they kind of hit that one-year commitment, so to speak, and they've kind of settled here in the New World, they kind of got an idea of what the New World was all about. And if you're out in the Georgia frontier at a military outpost, you know, it, it, maybe there are better places to live and work here in this New World other than you know, the Georgia frontier amongst all these bugs in the woods. And, we're right here by this lovely kind of island, but maybe there's something further inland, so people start moving inland into Georgia. They come here to Savannah. They move here to Ebenezer, go up into the Carolinas, which are much more established, or perhaps quitted the colony entirely and headed back to Europe. The New World, it's not for me. I'm gonna head back to Europe where I know things and have a much more established person. 1747 is interesting because it is also when Frederica starts to kind of cease being useful. 1748, peace is declared between Britain and Spain. Now, ma'am, let's suggest that you're the British crown here in our little story here today. George II himself. Are forts expensive? Yeah, okay. Um, now, with this peace treaty between Britain and Spain, and during the War of Jenkins Ear has fallen under a larger set of conflicts that becomes known as the War of Austrian Secession of all things, as we're sitting here talking about Salzburgers. It said all sides walked away from the bargaining table feeling they'd accomplished absolutely nothing in the better part of eight years of war. Nine years for the War of Jenkins Ear. And Spain decides that they are going to cede all of Georgia to the British Empire. Okay, so it's ours now. Okay, cool. Borders move down to about the St. Mary's River, where the border of Georgia is today. So Fort Frederica, highly sophisticated military outposts, regiment full of troops, kind of starts to sound like we don't really need it anymore. It's expensive. Do you like your soldiers wearing anything but the finest uniforms? Oh, let me, let me cut back here a slide or two. Um, I mean, they look really nice. <laughs> Your grenadiers, of course, looking great with their tall hats. Every single private soldier, doesn't matter if he is, in fact, uh, an officer or a private in the army, is to carry a sword. Because George does not want any of his men to go into combat without their swords. But no one's trained how to use it. So, you know, <laughs> it's just a showpiece. Um, okay, so this is expensive. And we don't need it. Let's just get rid of it. So, George decides to disband the 42nd Regiment of Foot. When the troops are disbanded, why are we staying? They stop sending supplies. The ships aren't coming anymore. Why am I going to stay here? I mean, there's got to be, a, like we just talked about, there's other places we can go. We can go to South Carolina. We can go to, yeah, I mean, we can finally go to Ebenezer. We can go to, you know, Savannah. Why stay here? So people start to leave. By 1756, 20 years after Frederica is established, a community that had over 1,000 people, population dwindles to less than 100. 1758, fires break out, destroys most of the community that we had. Uh, and leaves us with two visible structures, which is the King's Magazine on the left-hand side here, and the King's, uh, or I should say on my uh, left, your right, and the remnants of the barracks wall, which still stand today. Cut to 1903. The Colonial Dame Society wants to preserve the story because all we see is this and the remains of the earthworks. But if you don't know what an earthwork looks like, it looks like a hilly landscape, so you don't pay much attention. 
By this point, the land has become 12 different plantation sites over the course of the time frame. It's become farms. Uh, it has modern houses living on it. And people are starting to you know, forget Frederica's story. And it dissipates into memory. Colonial Dame Society buys up the land at Frederica, and they start wanting to preserve the story. And so what they do is they start donating it to the federal government to preserve it. In the 1940s, archaeological efforts are undertaken to uncover Frederica's story, which continues today. We're still on active archaeological ground. We are still learning more and more information about the people that lived and worked in that community. And that includes our Germans. Now, why am I showing Dreisler's letters again? We have copious scans of Dreisler's letters, and yet we are very few on people who speak 18th century German. Yet inside these letters are a treasure trove of information waiting to be revealed. Between 1742 and 1748, very little is ultimately known about the people's daily lives. Because nothing significant happened, so to speak, between 1742 and 1748. And yet, Dreisler, with all of his letter writing and, and diary, he is detailing daily lives of people taking a chance in a new world. Frederica is a story that most people just don't know about. But it's a story that really identifies who we are. What if Montiano had won? What if Montiano actually had taken over Frederica? Would you have stopped there? Probably not. Would he have gotten here? Maybe. Maybe there wouldn't be a Georgia. It could be in North Florida today. There wouldn't have been 13 colonies, there would have been 12. And our national story changes dramatically, and yet people who took a chance at a new life in this new world helped to create an identity that we still have today as the state of Georgia. So with that, folks, I want to thank you for inviting me out here today. If anybody has any questions, of course, feel free to ask. Hi, hey, yeah. The uh, Spanish, which Native Americans did they use and the English I don't have, yeah, I don't have a whole lot of information on the Span in the tribes the Spanish would have utilized. I mean, the, uh, the British had excellent working relationships with the Creek peoples, particularly the Yamacra, which, of course, up here in this area, very famous because they donated, uh, donated is not the right word, but essentially gave what became the bluff, Savannah Bluff, or Yamakra Bluff, I should say, uh, which became Savannah uh, through working agreements. And those working agreements maintained all the way through the actual early settling of Georgia itself, with the Creek peoples up and down the seacoast here. Uh, they had excellent working relationships with them. Um, particularly the Spanish themselves, I don't know offhand uh, what tribes the Spanish utilized. Yep. Yep. Yes. Yes. Yes, there were. Uh, I, there were in both battles, the Battle of Gully Hole Creek and the Battle of Bloody Marsh, there were Native Americans who took part in both of them. Um, we try our best to tell their perspective as best we can. Next weekend, in fact, March 18th, uh, humble plug, uh, we have our big living history event, and we actually have a person coming in to speak on uh, the Native American experience, particularly at Fort Frederica. Yeah, so they, they played a huge role in shaping uh, that town as well as Savannah. Was the Seminoles in what is where uh, the Spanish were in the time of that? Seminoles? That, that I can't speak to. Um, I, I know that they weren't up this far, so they wouldn't, you know, but uh, I don't know if they would have. I also don't believe Monciano brought any Native Americans with him. Um, he could have. I don't have that information firsthand. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, what portion of Dreisler's letters in German have been translated? Not, not that much. Um, my, my understanding is not much. We have uh, snippets, um, and there have been efforts kind of done because a lot of this stuff is actually over in Germany. Um, so there has been some done, but especially on our ends, we have scans of a lot of his letters. And there may be some stories that we already know that maybe are in those particular letters themselves. Uh, but 
it, a fair portion of it is kind of left for us to, if we could basically have like the ability to go back and read it. Because there's essentially what we're looking at is a couple different problems. First off, you know, 18th century dialect German is different than modern German. And second, you have to look at handwriting and actually how people would write as opposed, you know, because even in our own handwriting or cursive, it takes you a while to figure out what someone's actually saying even if you do in fact read cursive. So you gotta get through his handwriting, then understand what he's actually saying in the language. Uh, so we don't have much of his letters translated, but it's a treasure trove of information that'd be just great to have. So you have the digital copy? We have, di we have digital scans uh, on IRN of several. Right, I don't know if it's all five, but quite, a, quite some, yeah, it's, it's an amazing kind of feat. And he was very, like, when I, when I say like long-winded, like, he would write, write, every single one of his letters starts off with a prayer, uh, which would be about this long, uh, and then he would get into just his daily life. And part of that, I imagine, is because when you're writing a letter to someone, say, across the ocean, you know, nowadays you have an email. You can send an email pretty quickly. How's your day? Day's going fine. I had that meeting. It was fun. Click. Um, but then you, it's you know, six weeks or so across the ocean. So you're writing six weeks worth of stuff to kind of if you're trying to keep someone apprised of how everything's going. And if you want to be, you can be in very detailed about day one, 9 a.m., I woke up, I had breakfast, it was very nice, and then you go through the entire day, you can write a lot based off that just to kind of get someone up to speed. Yeah, I'll leave you a question right here. Yeah. I have a question about uh, 1738, 39, and mm -hmm. 40. Yeah. Those were when the Ebenezer people were down there. Is there no list or anything about... We do have, yeah. From? We do. We have a list. We have the list of all the people who lived at Frederica and where they came so from. Then we have to get the list from our writings that, that our pastors did and that kind of stuff. Yes, ma'am. Which of our ancestors fought there. Yeah, and we can. T we should be able to tell you that. We should be able to tell you pretty well, much. You said that, that Oglethorpe made up a lot about the Battle of Bloody Marsh. Yeah. What you do about nothing just so he could get to be a general. Well, he was. He already was a general at that point in time. He had made himself a general. He gotten a. The, Commission as a general when the 42nd Regiment of Foot was created in 1738. Uh, they were largely brought out of the Tower of London, as well as in areas in Savannah and some in London in general. Um, with 1742, you know, the battle becomes f uh, fairly overblown, which is not an uncommon thing. Uh, I cite, for instance, the American Civil War, okay, 1861. You look at a lot of those first, like between um, Fort Sumter and First Manassas, which is pretty about two and a half months, um, that there's a lot of battles that occur. And there was one, I, I took part at one point in actually writing a daily calendar for the National Park Service on day one, this happened on this day. And there was one battle that sticks out in my mind, I'm forgetting the name of it. Essentially it says, this, uh, this battle happened, there were no casualties, and essentially we fired one shot and left. <laughs> And it's like, oh, battle, okay. <laughs> um, and, that, and Bloody Martian is a classic example of that. But when we say that they kind of ran through all the ammunition, it, it makes you think that this was a very heavily contested thing. Uh, every soldier was only given 18 to 20 rounds. And you're supposed to load and fire your musket in 20 seconds. So it goes pretty quick. Uh, and if things are confused, you know, you're gonna have a lot of misfire, especially with the rain. So it wasn't as bad as the Bloody Marsh wasn't as bad. Gully Hole Creek was, um, but yeah. Yeah. Where are all the letters? Uh, largely, my understanding is most of them are over in Germany at this point in time, because he was writing to them actually in uh, archi uh, archives there. Um, we just have scans. Uh, is there someone on the ground at Frederick of Day that has obtained those? Or how, oh, we have, the, we have them in our file. Yeah, we have them in our files. We have them in our how, how, you know how they, who, who obtained them? I, the, the person to talk to about that would be Michael Seibert, who is our uh, chief of resources, uh, who could definitely tell that whole story, how that kind of came about. Yeah. Yes. That, that I don't know. I'll be honest. I'm not sure if they are available online. I'm not sure if that's the case. It'd be great. Yeah. So I just wanted to comment. I think Dreisler is the person who married Mary Musgrave to the bosom boyfriend. She, yeah, he was. Yeah. I thought so. Yeah. Uh, Dreisler uh, is a very interesting kind of character. He he was the uh, minister who married Mary Musgrove. Uh, if you're not familiar with Mary Musgrove, Mary Musgrove was a uh, woman who served as the interpreter between the Yamakra people and the English. Uh, she was half English, half Native American. Um, 
she was married three times, and the third time she was actually married in Frederica. Uh, her first two husbands died. She married in Frederica. Most of the town went to her wedding, and she honeymooned in one of the uh, houses there, which is why that house is called the Musgrove House, even though she didn't technically live there. So, yeah. Yeah? So on the slide that you have that shows the red stars, that shows the British encampment. Yes. Yep. You're talking about, it, it's lit up now. You're talking about essentially just below um, there, which if I'm not mistaken, that's Fort Argyle, Sterling's Fort, and Scout's Fort. Yeah, it's what, which Fort Argyle, Sterling, and Scout's. Okay, so Sterling is Richmond Hill, Argyle is the one up top, Scout's is Fort Argyle, and the other is what? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Scout's Fort. Scout's Fort, okay, that one. Okay, cool, thanks. Yep, not a problem. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Price of the letter, if we've got time to try something. Uh, no. Price of the letter, his correspondence, his personal, personal letters. Yes. It's not like somebody would uh, publish them. Yeah, they're, they, were pers they were personal letters uh, that he would write to friends and family. Um, and in some cases, of course, to Boltzius as well, that he would write to uh, you know, people about ongoings, about how things are going, uh, how the community is. Uh, but largely personal letters. Some are, some are professional in the case of like, like writing to Bolsius, but um, mostly just personal letters and you know, talking about his experiences in the new world. Mm -hmm. I, I should say, as far as we can tell from what we can understand. <laughs> yeah. Yes? So where was the fighting that happened in 1741? Where was the fighting that happened in 1741? Uh, so 17, are you talking about the, uh, uh, the Oglethorpe siege. Of, oh, so I, I, you see this blue star? That's St. Augustine, represents the Castillo de San Marcos. Uh, Oglethorpe made his way down the coast, had a couple of different engagements along the way, uh, and laid siege to the Castillo de San Marcos itself. A uh, very large fortification. If you haven't been there, it's a stone fortification made out of coquina, which is arguably the natural version of tabby. Um, and m cannonballs just bounced off of it. So, yeah. Any other questions real quick? Well, folks, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me today. I really appreciate that. <laughs>